Glasgow, uh, but not much, not to such a big extent. Let's talk to William Clouston now, uh, who's leader of the Social Democratic Party, because I want to ask him, where is the balance? Because I think we need to find out where the balance is, because one in three councillors is now saying they haven't got the bandwidth, if you like, to take any Afghan refugees because they simply don't have the housing, they've got plenty of problems of their own that they haven't fixed, and they don't have spaces in the schools either. William, a very good morning to you. Morning, Mike. Good to talk to yeah. you. I think this is an important conversation to have because, you know, some people are frightened of having it because they're scared of being accused of being racist, scared of being accused of being, you know, uh, uh, lacking in compassion. I'm neither of those things, but I also believe that we have a limit. We are a small country. Uh, we are quite a crowded country in most places. Um, and we can't just continue to invite people here and say, welcome with open arms. Yeah, I mean, it depends which categories of migrant we're talking about. Uh, in, in relation to Afghanistan, we, we do have a moral obligation to those that work for us. And I think most British people understand that and agree yeah. with that. And I think the, the, the wave of migration, if you want to call it that, uh, under the Arab scheme and, and so on, might be 12,000, might be eventually be 20,000 or even more. Mm. I think most people understand that. And I think there will be challenges for the councils. I can understand. It's not doesn't surprise me that two thirds of UK councils uh, haven't stepped up. But I think together, actually, but there's 333 principal councils in the country, Mike. If you do the maths, um, you know it's 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 20 or 30 or 40 each. I know it won't be like that because actually, in reality, the larger cities uh, like Manchester, Birmingham, London, and Leeds, and so on, will probably take the most. Mm. And actually, there there are resource challenges. I have a lot of sympathy with. Uh, the leaders of those councils uh, on resources. I mean, we've neglected public sector housing for years and years and years, and some of these chickens come home to roost. Mm. But I think that is a totally, I think the, 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 the migrants from Afghanistan presently, many of whom work for us, are a totally different category to the foolish open door policy we're running on the South Coast. Well, that's the thing. Um, and I was listening to Dan Jarvis, who's, uh, you know, the former MP, former veteran of Afghanistan as well, and also now mayor, I think, of uh, South Yorkshire. He was saying that it wouldn't be right for an awful lot of these uh, Afghan refugees to end up in the north of England, which I know is where you are as well. Um, yeah. And it would largely be the case that it could happen because it's cheaper to find housing in the north of England than it is in the southeast. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. I mean, in the county that I'm speaking from, Northumberland, there are actually pockets in southeast Northumberland where uh, social housing, the supply of social housing exceeds demand. So actually, logically, that is where uh, some of the migrants will go. Uh, and in the short term, that pretty much has to be the case. And if you're an Afghan migrant that is uh, scared of losing your life and being killed, then, it, 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 you know, it, you, you have to be settled where you can be settled and it's an emergency but i think in the long term it is it is true that uh people settle probably integrate better where there are other communities that can help them and where they feel more at home and actually and that is always the cities i don't know if you've seen it mike but there's a film uh doing the rounds now called limbo and i went to see it the other day mm. about uh it's set on in, in in remote scotland and it had sort of echoes of local here and other things it's quite an interesting film um, but that was about the, the challenges where, of disbursement. You know, you put people from Afghanistan uh, out into the remoter parts of the UK. Maybe that's not going to last because maybe they don't want to live there. Hmm. Well, I mean, on the other hand, maybe they prefer that, though, because if you're taking people from what could be a relatively remote country, because, yes, Kabul is a city, but an awful lot of these people may be from other parts of, uh, of Afghanistan. Because one of the things that was, one of the arguments that was made was that, you know, we can't nation build in Afghanistan because they don't want to live as a Western democracy. They live a very different kind of life. It's not for them uh, to have to, uh, to do the sorts of things that we do on, on a daily basis. It may be that the outer reaches of, uh, of Scotland and some remote island is, is better uh, for them to live in than, than it is to be in the middle of Manchester. I'm not sure I'm persuaded. I think initially the support systems that people, migrants have, are often within their own uh, ethnic group and religious group and so on. So I th I th I'm not persuaded by that. I think a lot of people, and it has been tried actually, I mean, in, in the short term, I think, again, you've got to distinguish between this emergency that we have now of accommodating people that are in fear of their lives and what will happen in the future. But as I say, a lot of chickens come home to roost when you neglect the council housing and the social housing stock as much as successive governments have done so in this country. And I blame 
New Labour every bit as much as the Tories on this. You know, it's it's really uh, the failure is incredible. We spend about six billion pounds a year building uh, social housing, and yet we spend about twenty six billion on housing benefits. It's, mm. it's short termism of the worst kind. Yes, exactly right. And when you look at the way that some of our uh, institutions are not exactly succeeding, like the NHS, where people up and down the country are struggling to get an appointment with a GP, uh, where people mm. are waiting uh, sometimes years to get an appointment uh, to get some kind of procedure done in hospital, where schools mm. are kind of limit up, where they're simply having to put you know, containers into playgrounds in order to make classrooms mm. bigger, uh, in order to, to, to accommodate more people where shortages mm. of housing are all over the place. You know, mm. why are we not having, the, why, why is no politician really having this conversation? Because I've got a typical reaction from somebody who calls himself Chunky. Uh, it says, just listen to a bloke called Mike Graham on talk radio for five minutes. Jesus, I was waiting for Wagner to start playing as he was kicking off about migrants coming into Britain. And this is a typical ignorant comment from people on the left who think that, you know, we have some kind of bottomless pit because somehow we have to allow everybody who wants to come here to come here. And there's plenty of people here who need help. There's plenty of people here um, who need um, the state to, to enable them to get the next leg up so that they can have some kind of life. And I'm sorry, it is not, as I say, a bottomless pit. No, I agree with you. Actually, it's not true that some people don't talk about it. We in the SDP do talk about it. And I interviewed Liam Halligan the other day, who's got an excellent book out about housing. And I tackled Liam on, on, on the question of the, the interlink between mass migration and housing. Mm. And you cannot ignore it. I mean, sorry, unless, if you're numerate, you cannot ignore this. Uh, we take in, in, a, in a high year about three quarters of a, a, a million uh, gross uh, inward migration. And, and that's a huge number. And remember, Mike, if that nets down to sort of 350 uh, thousand hmm. that's still more more than the number of housing units i mean i'm talking about flats and houses that we build a year yeah. you cannot i'm sorry particularly in the way you're speaking from the southeast london the southeast you cannot uh disentangle housing policy from migration you, mu you must consider it in the round and, I'm, and i know that obviously we've been governed by successive political establishments that are the reverse to planning they won't plan anything they won't uh, plan public transport or, or even health services properly, but they certainly won't plan housing. They'll do anything but talk about this. Yeah. And I'm afraid the first thing I would do, Mike, is to is to stop the illegal migration on the south coast. Yeah. And successful states like Denmark and Australia can do this, and they better get their skates on because mm. public the public are get, getting sick of this. And that's exactly right because part of the reason why I think people. Um, are less, um, shall we say, willing to invite anyone who wants to come here from Afghanistan is because of what's been going on for the best part of a year. Because what we've seen is an incredible ramping up of the numbers, um, a, a kind of um, industrialization, if you like, of the people trafficking business um, and many, many people making millions and millions of pounds um, and that we seemingly incapable to do anything about it. And if it wasn't for that, I'm sure people would be far more tolerant uh, of legal migration and people being welcomed into this country um, who deserve to be here. Of course. I mean, if you don't get your migration policy right, you will invite problems down the line. And and remember that the people arriving, the 12,000 people that have arrived illegally, and that's the ones they probably know about on the south coast illegally. That is not migration in the sense of uh, refugee migration. It's it basically economic migration. Uh, last time I went to France, which is two years ago, uh, France was a safe country, a very mm. pleasant country. You cannot argue that those people, I think what those people are doing are, are, are what I would call jurisdiction shopping. Yeah. What they're doing is going around and saying, well, I rather like what Britain offers. I'll just, I'll just move in there. They are not fleeing their lives in the, in the sort of 54 convention sense. It's, it's untrue. I have a friend, you know, years back, a, a, an Ethiopian who, who was a, a migrant to Sudan uh, during, during conflict there. Yeah. And he was in Sudan, and then he went home, back home to Ethiopia. That 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 is a genuine, uh, you know, a refugee who who is not. This is a completely different category, and I think most British people can see that. But you can't. I would argue. I mean, we've argued as a party for less migration anyway. I think mass migration, and and certainly the sort of open borders that we've had with the EU uh, in the labour market, yeah. have had two main effects, Mike. I mean, the one one effect is to depress wages, particularly lower wages. And a second effect is to discourage training. And we've got the lorry drivers uh, issue uh, 
arising. And, and I think that, that that sort of is interrelated to Brexit in a way, because we've for years, we've just relied on foreign labour. We've, we've totally forgotten about the need to train our own people. Yeah. And why is that, though? Because an awful lot of people in this country would say, well, we don't want to do that job because, quite frankly, we wouldn't work for that kind of money. And there's been a kind of an undercutting. One of the things that, that Australia did very, very well was they produced um, proper trade unions who actually protected minimum wages, who protected um, the fact that if you were uh, working in a particular job, you couldn't be undercut by somebody coming from another country. And that's as much to do with the employers as it is to do with the immigrants. Yeah, the minimum wage in Australia is very high. You know, I, I, you probably know we're an Anglo-Australian family, and 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 two of our lads have worked in, in, in Melbourne for for a few years. Yeah, and they've gone by now. But they, yeah, I mean, it's very very high. Um, I my reaction. I mean, all this all this hand wringing about oh, we're going to have to spend more uh, on wages, and oh, you know, uh, lorry drivers are being paid more. I, I would say it's about time. Yeah, you know, actually. The, what the the returns that capital gets and the return the returns that labor gets has been skewed in, in favor of capital for a long time and I, I'm, I'm bringing it on I mean uh, as far as our theory about what brexit was about I think to a great extent it was about training British workers and getting wages up and and, and both of those things are consequences and all the remainers complaining about it and increasing prices and so on well lap it up yeah. Well, also, you know, we always get told, oh, we can't make, uh, pay people more money because the prices of everything will have to go up. Well, I'm not quite sure why that has to always be the case, because what we do know uh, is that many of these companies make an awful lot of money. Um, and the, and, and the, I guess they're now reaping the whirlwind of using a lot of foreign labour, which in the end is casual. And if it doesn't like what is happening, will disappear. Yeah, they use it as slack. It's used as slack. And actually, it also has a terrible effect long term on UK productivity. Mm. But you have an open uh, labor market like that. And, and if demand increases, you can just uh, get your factory slightly fuller for, for labor. You, you're using labor as slack in that sense. It actually disincentivizes capital investment as well. What, it's not actually a, a puzzle to me why UK productivity isn't as high as it should be. I think, it, I think the open labor markets that we've had over the past 20, 30 years are partly a cause of that. And I think it's correcting. I think it'll take time to correct, Mike. I think some of these issues of people, again, Remainers complaining about the choices of their sandwich mm. filling being reduced and so on, as you say, yeah. McDonald's not being, it doesn't bother me. No. I think, honestly, there are bigger issues at stake here. Well, exactly right. And I'm looking at your Twitter uh, at the moment, and you, I see you put something out about uh, how the Tories are deliberately shortlisting foreign suppliers in India and the Netherlands for a one and a half billion pound contract to supply fleet solid support vessels for the Royal Navy. So, I mean, yes. if the government's doing that, you can't really blame, I suppose, private business for doing the same. Well, that, yes, and remember, it's a Tory government. I mean, we again, it gets back to the sort of theory of what sort of Brexit you wanted. On the centre-left, we wanted a, a more domestically focused Brexit. I've argued for slightly more trade friction. I want our factories to be busier, making goods for us and others. I don't, I'm not convinced at all that we couldn't build these vessels. We can actually. I mean, there are there are there are UK mm. firms on the shortlist as well, but it just strikes me as indifferent. You know, it's not the not the uh, the, the the Brexit that we wanted. I, I I want I want the government to take more seriously reshoring, and I want them to think about supply lines. I mean, I think hasn't the pandemic, Mike, proved that what what is made where and by whom matters? Surely. Well, I think it matters if it starts to affect the ongoing kind of economy of your country. And I'm not one for protectionism, but by the same token, you can't be completely and utterly unaware of the fact that if you export all of your manufacturing to another country and you don't have anybody who can do anything anymore, that's a problem. It's a major problem. And you'd, you, we've, you know, as a party, we've fought three by-elections this year and uh, they've been uh, tough by-elections to fight. But, you know, Airdrie... Uh, Hartlepool and Batley are all post-industrial towns. Yes. And, and honestly, you only have to speak to people and have a look around to see the cost of the industrialization there. You know, they, they've removed the industrial, well-paid industrial job, mm. which was the which was the foundation of the family. And and obviously the social problems that result uh, down the, downstream from that are, are colossal. So I want us to think about causes. I want us to think. I want us to re-industrialize. And I think we can do it, but you have to first, you have to have a political class 
that wants to do it. Yes. And I think we need skilled working to be brought back to this country because we were very good at it. Uh, we were the engineers of the world at one point. And, you know, it's unfashionable to say that now because you're accused of being some kind of mad, um, you know, flag waving maniac. But in fact, mm. I think we should be proud of our country and what this country makes and, and what it doesn't make anymore uh, it makes us worse off. I don't wish to necessarily import absolutely everything. I don't want everyone to go to university and get a degree in media studies uh, and go and sit in some think tank, you know, because that's not for everybody. We need more. We need more manual workers. We need more experts in, in plumbing, in mechanics, in all of the things that we used to be good at. And I don't understand why this government doesn't seem to see it. All they've got for us now is the green revolution. And they seem to think that they're going to be building so many wind turbines in Grimsby that everyone will be happy. Well, we won't be. Well, I just think it's I think it's a legacy of being conditioned over many, many years that there is no alternative. You know, so ultra free trade is the only thing you can do. And the idea of training your own population to do something is anathema to some people. So yeah. I think it just takes a bit of time for reality to dawn. Actually, you can't, it's not fair to other places either. You look at the health service. We 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 have it's full of uh, doctors and nurses from other jurisdictions and often poorer jurisdictions yeah. and it shouldn't be beyond us to train enough people to run our own health service but you're quite right mike on universities universities must be slimmed down drastically i think it's not socially useful to get half of all school leavers to go to university mm. I'd, I'd go for vocational training and skills instead absolutely right and that would help everybody uh, and it would stop people from somehow having jobs which didn't last very long because they keep getting undercut by somebody who comes in and does it cheaper. William, great to talk to you as ever. William Clouston, leader of the Social Democratic Party, a party that speaks for an awful lot.